Hey, good morning. Yes, it is. It is Tuesday, July 23rd. Yes, I said I probably wouldn't do a video this morning, but I happened to get up at 3 this morning instead of 4. So that's going to give me the leeway, or at least give me time to get the video done and then up maybe a little after 7. So I thought today we would talk about some of the things that kind of you chase your tail on right on repairs and you start thinking that maybe the customers lost it <laughs> and then brandon towards the end i want to bring up some i see what you're getting at you're not looking at what stock your service truck with for the basics because you've been doing this for a while so you already figured that out what else would be good on that truck to keep you from leaving a repair job and going home and having to go back. So on those two, stay tuned. Welcome back. My name is Eric, and this is the weekday, Monday through Friday. Today is Tuesday, the 23rd of July. So, <clears throat> some of the things that you chase your tail on, right? Like, we had a customer last week call and say that, now they're a regular customer, say that the lawnmower will run for just about 10 minutes and then quit. All right, so, you know, we're both Claude and I are thinking outside the box, right? No, it's not outside the box, it's diagnostic. Coil, if it heats up to a certain point, can do that. We've seen bugs in the fuel or crap in the fuel tank that, like a leaf, will come over and settle on top of the point of where the fuel goes down to the fuel pump or to the carburetor directly we've seen where it's so hot out that actually that you get like this vapor lock caused from a unvented fuel cap that happens and sometimes the quickest way out of that is just throw a new fuel t cap on it right so we got it out him and his wife dropped it off and i'm thinking does his wife have some kind of a timer on this sucker because the heat has been up almost to 90 and he's claws age and they won't live on tractors anymore. So maybe the wife has done something to the lawnmower. <laughs> so I asked her. She said, no, 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 I haven't done anything to the lawnmower. I said, all right, just checking. So while we were working on other jobs, I went out and I started it up and let it run. And let it run long enough that we lost track track of time and realized that we needed something up to my house, which is just up the road. So we both took off in my truck real quick, come back, and the lawnmower wasn't running anymore. I said, I guess nobody was here to time how long it took for that lawnmower to quit. So Claude went out again and started it right back up. And it did. It run for 8 to 10 minutes. And then it would go into a fit and quit. But the funny part was, you could start it right back up. Anybody got any ideas? Faulty fuel solenoid. Now, I've seen them go, and I see them get stuck, you know, from sitting through the winter or periods of time. Where they get gummed up, 
most times you can repair them. But hardly ever have I seen them have issues while running. And what was happening is it was clicking on and off so much that the fuel solenoid was so hot, electric fuel solenoid, that we had a spare, so we popped his off, put that one on, and now it wouldn't quit. Not after 10 minutes, not after 20 minutes. So we localized it down to the electric fuel pump, or solenoid, fuel solenoid. That's the first one I've seen go while running. Usually it won't start up, right? So they're happy. They got the lawnmower back, and we happen to have a good used one. So we charged them half of what a new one was, told them if they had any more problems with that, that we put a new one on it, but we thought this one would last this season anyways, and that's all they wanted. So what are the things that you have that you're kind of left scratching your head on that you're trying to figure out what is the issue? See, there's a difference between diagnosing and diagnosing, right? And you're going to say, no, there's not. You, you do a diagnostic on it, right? Yeah, but there is a difference. It's the level of experience the mechanic has when he approaches any piece of equipment. Now, Jason and Travis are probably higher up there than I am, and you might be quicker at diagnosing things than me because you've worked on them all your life, right? Or for the most part, you made it your trade. But I've worked on it quite a long time too. And that wealth of knowledge is stored. And, and like with this electric fuel solenoid, it may not come up again for the next 20 years. But when it does, guess what? If it runs 10 minutes, quits, but starts back up, I'm gonna lean towards that. Instead of coil, fuel cap, bugs or leaves in the fuel tank. I'm going to reach down and see if that suck, if that puppy's hot. If that puppy's hot, you got a defective fuel solenoid, right? And that's located around the bottom of the carburetor. So for you guys that are out there that are having an issue with your lawnmower running 10 minutes and then quitting, but you can start it right back up, that might be your issue if it's a coil nine times out of ten it will not start back up until you allow it to cool down that's one way of eliminating a coil is and the other way is throwing a spark tester on it and seeing if you're getting intermittent spark or no spark coming off that coil But if it quits and it won't start back up, keep coil on the list or coils. I've seen both go at the same time. I've seen the grounding issue where it would ground and shut off. I've seen wires in the whip hit the frame and short the machine out. So, I mean, some things you're going to find quicker and other things you're going to take a lot of time and a lot of time that you don't feel justified in charging your customer for that we end up eating right if the customers if my customers knew how much extra i give them they probably go wow we don't broadcast it we try to treat everybody fairly and i'm sorry i do go by how much they have to spend in some cases that you know if i know that they are on a fixed income social security maybe a little bit of pension and 
it's taken longer than it should to figure out and get it fixed. I know that that person, whether it be a man or a woman or both, I know that they can't afford, you know, a certain amount over a certain amount, right? So I cap them. And what is capping? It's capping is I know what they can afford to spend. And Claude and I, that's the number you can't go above. Or if you go above, we're doing it on our time. And we've done that for years, quite a few years. And customers appreciate that. But most times you don't tell the customer that you get, you got more time than you want to admit into the fixing their lawnmower. But that's what where it's good to have a mix of customers, right? As far as their yearly income from low end to upper end, right? Now, if you've seen any of my videos. Early on, I talked about pro bono, and I still recommend, highly recommend that if you can do it. And that is to the customers you know that really are going to try to make a choice between paying you for that lawnmower repair or buying groceries for the house that week. If you can afford to write that off, just the, I know for some, it doesn't matter. Well, I know the feeling that it gives me inside by just simply saying, no charge. And you have to do that on a customer-by-customer customer basis. You don't just, you know, get talking to them and all of a sudden, you know, the first sentence is, what's your yearly income? <laughs> no, no, no. It comes from knowing people over time, right? And I do, I value the relationships. So I ask a lot of questions about them, if they're a new customer and, you know, background, what they used to do if they're retired. And and I try to make our customers our friends, all right? And so that they understand that they're ha they have a friend on their side working on their lawnmower that's going to try to save them money. And in some cases, you know, you do the pro bono. But on the other swing, I've got customers that know to come do anything with their equipment. That requires Claude and I to be out of the shop for the whole day. So now you're talking anywhere between twelve and fifteen hundred dollars plus travel expense. And we have customers up on Lake Champlain that are willing to pay that because they will not let anybody else touch their equipment. And a lot of times it's dealerships burnt them, you know, charging this big number and still not getting what they want. Where I listen first and then I talk after just kind of bringing them back to okay so this is the issue this is what you want resolved and so on and then your bread and butter is going to be your every day in between right you're not going to see a lot of the big donors unless you're living right on and you're servicing just equipment on the lake or you know some place that wealthy people are. I mean, I had a friend. He wasn't a friend until he came up. He was looking at a piece of my property that I had for sale. And he became friends. And his name is Matt. And he's my son's age. But he was telling me in his area, because he runs a, uh, what do they call it? It's a property management business. And he's got customers, he was telling me, that have close to 1,200-acre properties. And some have front yards 
as big as 200 acres. I'm not saying two acres. I'm saying 200 acres. And part of his job is keeping all the yards mowed. Anything that goes wrong in the, the buildings, that whether hot water here goes up or roof needs to be patched, he's got electricians, he's got roofers, he's got... And he could get bigger if he could find people willing to work. And he's from PA, or Connecticut, right on the New York-Connecticut border. And I know where he's at and how affluent some of those are, especially you get out on Long Island. You know, you have what I call the poor side and the well-to-do side. And he... More than once, he said he's had to go into Manhattan to talk to his customers about stuff they want done on their summer homes. And they do everything from gardening, you know, sprucing up things. But like he said, those people are willing to pay whatever. They don't question the bill. They just get it done. And if you can fill your customer list with all of those customers, you got it made. But if you're just the average mechanic like us, the average shop, those are few and far between because of my location. But if I wanted more of them and I advertised more around the lakes that are up here, that are getting million dollar homes being put in, that changes dynamics, right? So just keep that in mind. So getting back to the electric fuel solenoid, what things have you had happen, you know, that give you that coming to Jesus or aha moment that for you it's the first time you've seen it? And I did a Google search and I didn't see hardly anywhere. I didn't see anywhere where it said that they had a problem with the fuel solenoid while running. It's always, they can't get it running. So, here's your time to put your two cents in of what things you may have seen. And again, it goes back to your level experience, right? And how you approach a diagnostic on something something that might take me 10 minutes Travis or Jason may be able to knock it out in five and why is that well maybe they've seen that before and I haven't so it's going to take me a little longer to get an education to add to my rotisserie rotisserie my Rolodex of the issues that might be going on with it. And this is now getting added to that book. I may never see it again, but I'm going to add it to my book. And when somebody starts to tell me they got a lawnmower that quits after 8 to 10 minutes or more or less, and it starts right back up, I can also tell them, check this too. Don't grab right a hold of the fuel solenoid because this was so hot it would burn you. If you use the back of your hand, I got taught this during welding, is if you use the back of your hand, it's the most sensitive part, right? And if you approach anything and you check here, you're going to pick up more heat quicker than you would if you had your hand like this. So you're more likely to get burnt by going like this versus coming in from the backside and just checking temperature. That will tell you whether she's hot, hot, or not. Or you can go to Harbor Freight and you can buy a unit that will give you infrared. It tells you the temperature of a localized object. Probably easier, right? All right, so let's get on to you, Brandon, and what I think you're after. All right, so you've been doing this for a while, nights and weekends, so you already know what the basics are. But some of the things that I find helpful that could we do do service work 
where we go to the customer's property. At times, depending on who the customer is, how far away, what have you. And the cost is more than because you're taking me out of the shop. But we carry in the truck extra pulleys. And a lot of times, these are used pulleys that you can pull right off junkers that you're going to accumulate of where you're going to have your customers say, you want it, take it. And if you got some acreage that you can hide out back, you know, those are real handy because sometimes the decks are gone, but the motor's good, motor's blown, but the decks are good. And we get 150 a deck if we pull it out from either a non non running machine but we also look at them as partners so what we the biggest thing is that you don't use on a regular basis but it's handy to have on that truck would be different size pulleys idler pulleys some spindle pulleys especially the the craftsman husqvarna's because they're they spin sometimes and they all, well, if they're not tight, tight. Some extra shafts for the spindles where you can just knock the shaft out, put a new spindle on it with the stars and everything meshing up. If it's because it's destroyed that spindle. And if you try to get the spindle out, you're going to take most time with oxidation those three or four screws that are holding that to the deck are going to snap off inside. Actually, when I approach it, I put mine in forward and just snip them off. Just zip them off so that they just break up inside and I toss the, the unit. If I need to fix it on the deck, I won't touch those bolts. Springs. Idler springs. And again, they all come in different flavors. But if you got a, enough units out back, you can start kind of building like Jason has with box. So you got a box of just springs. You put springs in there. Some are like this, some are like this, depending on what you're working on, right? Belts, blades, you should already have that on your truck. If you're doing customers where you know what their machine is, what it's going to take for blades and belts and all that. Cables. Engagement cables, throttle cables. You know, again, you don't need brand new in the package. If you can afford it, perfect. But a lot of times we just take those things and throw it onto the truck in the toolbox. So, because we run into issues before where we went for one thing and it was something totally different, right? Brakes on a deck. Those I suggest you get new. And those are mainly for the ones that are manual engagement. Your electric PTO will stop spinning the minute you disengage it. So... You don't have to worry about it on those. Tubes of a couple different flavors. You know, your 8s and your 6s are your most common. Uh, some type of air. I mean, I don't know how your service truck is equipped, whether you have a, a generator of some kind that's running an air compressor. But at the very least, you can buy the ones you can plug into a cigarette lighter or a jump pack. And they're slow, but they still get the job done. And you could start blowing up a tire while you're working on something else, right? So that brings a way to get air to inflate tires. Simple as that. Harbor Freight, I think. They're like 20 bucks, $25. But the thing is, is, you know, when you put it on... If you're, if you're taking used out of your boneyard, tell your customer. They, they will appreciate you trying to save them money. Uh -huh. <laughs> and even further, you trying to get them going today versus coming back three days later and, and rains in the forecast. They don't get the yard mode, right? 
So if you can put on a used one to get them by, a lot of times your customer will just say, that's fine, perfect, I'll pay that. And if I do have a problem, then I'll give you a shout, and then you can come out and put a new one on it. But until then, there's too many different kinds of coils to carry coils on the truck. You know, I don't have big compartments. You know, you're a three-quarter ton service truck. No, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head on these things. A couple of different tie rods for the front, for the steering. They're just the end pieces. They break off or get lost. Of course, grease and a grease gun. And you can get battery operated like we have. Or you can do the manual. Manual's cheaper. So what other things do you think Brandon could use on that service truck that are above and beyond what you would normally have going to a customer post it in the comments so on that note i gotta get showered up so i can get headed to the doctor's appointment and you guys have a wonderful tuesday